Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode we're going to be discussing the context of the oft misunderstood most recent universal matrilineal ancestor, Eve. So let's jump right in. <laughs> The previous tale, that of the Cro-Magnon, left us about 50,000 years ago. Today's tale takes us to around 200,000 years ago. First, we've left the anatomically modern Homo sapiens and are now among the archaic Homo sapiens. There are a few morphological characters that distinguish these archaics, as the authors call them, from us moderns. Our average brain size is about 1400 cubic centimeters, while that of archaics is 1200 to 1300 cubic centimeters. They are slightly more robust than us with slightly thicker skulls, more pronounced brow ridges, and less pronounced chins. According to a 2014 paper, this lessening of the brow ridge has been termed craniofacial feminization and reflects lowering levels of adult circulating testosterone, which could have also inadvertently increased social tolerance. The tale also takes place in Africa, probably East Africa. All archaic populations lived, as far as we know, in Africa, with moderns only leaving the continent around 50,000 years ago. But Eve's tale isn't so much about sociality or tools, though both of those played a role in the evolution of archaics. Instead, this tale is about genetics. The authors begin the tale with a discussion of genetic inheritance, which we also covered in a video of the same name. Remember, we get half of our genes from our father and half from our mother, or we get a set of alleles from our father and another set from our mother. Remember that our sex cells, or gametes, are haploid, unlike all our other cells, which have the full complement of chromosomes, called diploid. Normally, for a trait to be considered recessive, that trait will only surface in the phenotype if one has inherited the alleles for that trait from both parents. If you inherit only one copy of the recessive allele from one parent, but express the other inherited allele, then the one being expressed is dominant because only one copy of the allele is required for expression. There is an exception to this, though. Sex-linked traits. Not all of our traits come in on our 22 pairs of autosomes. Some genes, like SRY, which is largely involved in sex determination, are on the sex chromosomes. This gene specifically is located on the Y chromosome. Now, sex-linked traits do not necessarily follow the rules of Mendelian inheritance. People can have different combinations of these sex chromosomes, most commonly are XY and XX, which largely, but not always, correspond to male and female, respectively. The Y chromosome confers very few traits, but a number of traits are passed via the X chromosome. In the European royal families, for instance, one type of hemophilia, a genetic disorder that prevents the normal clotting of blood, is commonly found among its members, and the alleles that cause this disorder are passed on the X chromosome. The first known royal family member to carry an allele for hemophilia appears to have been Queen Victoria, and she passed an X chromosome with the hemophilia allele to three of her four children. Her one son, Prince Leopold, did suffer from hemophilia. Females with two X chromosomes can be carriers of a recessive disorder, but not suffer from it as long as their other X chromosome does not have the recessive allele. However, males with one X and one Y chromosome will necessarily suffer from the disorder if they receive just one copy of the recessive allele on their one X chromosome. The reason is that there is no locus for the same gene on the Y chromosome, so the Mendelian rule of needing two copies of a recessive allele doesn't apply. This brings us to an interesting point about gene trees versus genealogy trees. We discussed the concept of genealogy trees in the Tasmanian's Tale. Everyone on Earth has two parents, and their parents each had two parents, and so on. By contrast, an allele has only one parent. Either you got that allele from your mother or your father. And just like in the Tasmanian's tale, we can trace alleles in individuals back to a most recent common ancestor, or MRCA. We can, for example, trace the hemophilia allele from Princess Heinrich and Valdemar of Prussia to their mother, Princess Irene of Hesse and Byrhine, to her mother, 
Princess Alice of the United Kingdom, and ultimately to Queen Victoria, who is the MRCA of the Haemophilia allele. The tree given for a particular allele is different depending on the allele. If we decide to track the MRCA of, say, blue-eyed individuals, specifically those with the blue-eye allele of the gene HERC2, then that gene tree would probably go back a few thousand years. In fact, a 2008 paper purports to have tracked the origin of this allele to upwards of 10,000 years ago in the Black Sea region. Though there is no single gene that controls eye color, a mutation in the 86th intron of a gene called HERC2 seems to be highly correlated with blue eyes. Clearly, we can trace genes and alleles backwards through the generations, but is there any way to, say, trace genes backwards through an exclusively male or female set of ancestors? Can we trace a gene from our mother, to our maternal grandmother, to her mother, and so on? As it happens, yes, and this type of kinship tracing is known as matrilineality. In our cells is an organelle called the mitochondrion, which has bacterial heritage. Mitochondria are pretty much only passed maternally. Males normally cannot pass on their mitochondria. Though, males can on rare occasions pass their mitochondria. It's a gross-sounding phenomenon called paternal leakage. It happens so infrequently that we don't really need to concern ourselves with it here. Conversely, the Y chromosome can only be passed from male to male, father to son to grandson, etc. This is called patrilineality. Let's do a similar exercise to the one in the Tasmanian's Tale. Let's go backwards to the MRCA. But instead of the MRCA of all extant humans, regardless of which ancestral lines among billions we happen to choose, let's find the MRCA of human mitochondria and Y chromosomes, tracing only the matrilineal and patrilineal lines. The MRCA of human mitochondria, which we can only find by going through exclusively female ancestors, is unfortunately known as mitochondrial Eve. I say unfortunately because the name was borrowed from the biblical Genesis myth. Humorously, one of the researchers who helped determine when Eve lived commented that the moniker was regrettable. Regardless, in that myth, Adam and Eve were the only two humans on the planet until the end. This is not at all the case for mitochondrial Eve and the MRCA of human Y chromosomes. Y chromosome Adam. For starters, these two were not the first people in history, but honorific titles for people depending on the population you're investigating. If we, say, happen to find a new population of extant humans who are sister to all other humans, then the date for both mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam would go back further in time. And even if we ignore any possibility of any unknown sister, matrilineal, or patrilineal lines to all that are known, the specific identity of the Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve change over time. Each lived more recently when some descendant branches became extinct. To illustrate this more intuitively, let's say for the sake of argument that the literal creationist interpretation of Genesis is true. Adam was originally both the first human male and also the Y chromosome Adam, but after Noah's flood, nearly all patrilineal lineages that descended from Adam became extinct. All surviving patrilineal lines now go through Noah and his sons, thereby making Noah the new Y chromosome Adam. So yes, even if we accept creationism, the name Y chromosome Adam would still be a misnomer. It's also important to stress that Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve weren't the only humans on the planet, just like the Noah example also illustrated. It's almost certain that they were not an interbreeding couple, they didn't even live at the same time, and neither lived six to 10,000 years ago. They were members of a population of humans, and they could have been separated by tens of thousands of years. These two weren't the most recent common ancestors for all humans. Remember from the Tasmanian's tale that we had reached both the MRCA of extant humans and the identical ancestors point long before these two were around. So, then, when exactly did these two live? In the late 1970s and early 80s, Wesley Brown and colleagues argued that the rate of base substitution for mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA, is 0.5 to 1% per lineage per million years, and that mtDNA mutates between 5 and 10 times faster than nuclear DNA, or nDNA. The sequence heterogeneity for extant humans is 0.18%, meaning that the sampled humans differed from an inferred ancestral mtDNA sequence at 0.18% of their base pairs. So the researchers calculated that this indicates the MRCA of extant human mitochondria live between 
180 and 360,000 years ago. Then, in 1987, Rebecca Kahn and colleagues published a study arguing that the common ancestor of extant human mitochondria lived about 200,000 years ago, which falls within the range of the earlier papers. This study was picked up by popular science communicators, and that MRCA was thus designated EVE. In addition to an approximate time for mitochondrial EVE, the 1987 study shaped arguments revolving around the spread of humans out of Africa. Utilizing mtDNA from 147 individuals, the study found that African mtDNA is paraphyletic to all other humans, meaning the ancestral lines of non-Africans are just a descended subset of the ancestral lines that are present in Africa. In short, everyone is descended from people who lived in Africa, a fact which we've discussed before on this channel. So according to this study, mitochondrial Eve lived about 200,000 years ago in Africa, and this conclusion accorded with both contemporary paleontology and archaeology. Combined, this evidence favored a single Homo sapiens common ancestor of the human populations outside of Africa. Why does this matter? In the 1980s and 90s, a debate was raging between two camps of anthropologists, the out-of-Africa supporters and the multi-regionalists. Now, these names are a little confusing because both hypotheses require at least one migration out of Africa, so we can follow Dawkins and Wong's renaming of them as Recent African Origin, or RAO, and Ancient African Origin, or AAO, respectively. The RAO hypothesis proposes that Homo sapiens left Africa, spreading to the far corners of the globe, whereas the AAO hypothesis posits that an earlier species that is ancestral to us, specifically Homo erectus, left Africa much earlier in time, dispersing to the various continents. The AAO hypothesis further argues that there was constant gene flow between the continents, so the entire world Homo erectus population gradually transitioned to archaic Homo sapiens, before fully modern Homo sapiens. So, Eve majorly contributed to the demise of the AAO hypothesis. At least, that version of the hypothesis. We know now that Homo erectus did, in fact, leave Africa much earlier than Homo sapiens, around 2 million years ago, though non-African Homo erectus went extinct long before Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa. Y chromosome Adam also supports the RAO hypothesis with an African origin around 254,000 years ago, according to a 2015 study. This study also indicates that all non-African lineages coalesced to a most recent common ancestor around 50,000 years ago. Interestingly, Alan Templeton, who was vehemently opposed to the RAO hypothesis, correctly pointed out that people of Asian descent have DNA that definitely didn't come from Africa. If the RAO hypothesis is true, then how can this be? That, dear viewer, will be the subject of the next tale. Thus far, we've talked about comparing the mitochondria and Y chromosomes of various individuals, but did you know that we can learn a lot about human population history from a single person's in-DNA genome? It's true. Recall coalescent theory, the branch of mathematical evolutionary biology that seeks MRCAs. In general, the smaller the population, the more likely two lineages will cross, meaning there will be a higher rate of coalescences for a particular genome region. If numerous genetic sequences across the genome have a high rate of coalescences, then that indicates a population bottleneck. Or, if there is a very low rate of coalescences, then that indicates a larger population. Combine that with a molecular clock, like the one we mentioned earlier for mtDNA, and you can pinpoint the approximate time that bottleneck occurred. When done on a single diploid individual, this is called a pairwise sequentially Markovian coalescent, or PSMC model, which was developed by Heng Li and Richard Durbin in 2011. Li and Durbin found that when comparing the genomes of a grand total of seven individuals, one Chinese male, one Korean male, three European individuals, and two Yoruba males, which for reference is an ethnic group from Western Africa, that a very interesting pattern appeared. For starters, the Yoruba genomes indicate a split from the non-Africans at about 110,000 years ago, and the non-African genomes point to a major bottleneck upwards of 60,000 years ago, both of which match the archaeological data pretty closely. Since this method has the ability to approximate the number of individuals in a population based on the rate of coalescences, 
it pretty conclusively demonstrates that the human species never dropped below a few thousand individuals in the past million years. So that's Eve's tale. Genealogies based on genes have the potential to go much further backwards in time than those based on individuals. The reason, as we've seen, is that the common ancestor of all living humans lived just a few thousands or tens of thousands of years ago, whereas population genetics necessitates that the common ancestor of two different alleles may have lived hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions of years ago. For example, the common ancestor of the blood type alleles predates our split with old world monkeys around 25 million years ago, but that's a tale for another day. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.